Hey, hi everyone. Welcome to your show, eCopy with Experts. This is your host, Ranmay here. And today we have JJ, who is the found, you know, founder of Manlim with us. Hey, JJ, how is it going? Yeah, good. Um, I'm glad to be here. Glad to, glad to talk to you. Lovely. JJ, before we move any forward, let's get to know the human behind the mic. To start off, we would ideally want you to briefly introduce yourself, talk a bit about your journey, how did you get into the digital marketing space, and also a bit about Manlem, your agency, your, the, the software, the tool, what do you guys specialize in, and then we take it from there. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I guess the journey started a while back, so 15 years ago. I was graduating with STEM distinction and also academic arts, cum laude diploma as well. So I wanted to combine like the two things, the design and the technologies. So I went to computer-generated studies 15 years ago, and that turned out to be quite innovative at the time. And yeah. It was basically AR, VR type of technology. And I was quite lucky to be selected for Best New Designers show where I was discovered mm -hmm. by the global market, the marketing store worldwide and the global McDonald's creative team uh, and basically got hired straight from uni for, for their AR, VR initiatives, marketing, sales marketing and premium led sales. So started working on global brands like McDonald's, Nestle, Carlsberg, straight from uni. And, and then like after a while became like a global leader in the global programs leader as well. And decided to, after a while, go back to computer software engineering and development to just learn more things. And that's where AI, SEO, MarTechs became a bit of a focus and just did a bunch of those automations and then led teams, led squads as a tech lead, co-founded the uh, startup and the second startup in where that's where we are here today. It's a MarTech, MarTech startup called Marlum and we help businesses and move away from ads we're using an alternative more scalable and cheaper solutions so yeah basically in a nutshell absolutely and you touched upon ai when you are in the space for quite some time now and coming from computer software background right you can relate to when i'm saying that ai exploded in 2019 but but it always existed prior to that as well so in today's date, what is the general take on AI, JJ? And where do you think we are? And where do you think we are heading with all the AI storm that, that's going on? Yeah, so it's a really interesting question. I feel what we're seeing now with AI and personalization, customization, all of that is simply hitting the mainstream. But this trend and deep research on what AI is capable of, what is augmented reality? What is virtual reality? What needing to customize for individual customers have been, like I would say, under the water for a while. And uh, the first moments I recall is 12 years ago when at the marketing store worldwide, we had quite huge meetings about big trends we we're identifying and I remember customization and tailoring being firm, firmly on the table back then, 12 years ago. And it's to do with the rise of internet and the rise of many echo chambers and rise of uh, ability to be completely surrounded in your own bubbles. And that, that gave rise to the need to reach out and tailor messaging, tailor channels, all of that. I remember back then, 12 years ago, thinking and, 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 and presenting also that the customers want bespoke and tailored versions of products. And at that time, we were solving premium-led sales for, for McDonald's, global driving sales with um, happy, to happy Meal Toys or driving sales with premium products uh, for Nestle or Carlsberg. Uh, and, and, and I remember very vividly that we had to find a way to make the same product completely unique to individual customer. And back then, that at that time, we found like some cheaper solutions We're using customization with stickers and all of those things. But technically you can, you could deliver on that complete bespoke tail tailorization at scale. And what I see the future, if, if we continue to follow this trajectory with AR, VR, as well with the rise of the fully augmented realities as well, is that we're just going to see this trend go completely on steroids. And what I believe is going to happen is that no two people will experience the same version of web, World Wide Web. Everything will reach a point where we will have that echo chamber in a way 
or bubble journey in a bubble um, all, all throughout the the whole web, pretty much. So it's I guess it's like an extreme illustration, but if we follow the last 12 years and, and then the, the next 12 years, I, I believe this is firmly where we're heading. And co couple that with digital first experience and age of AI, I think businesses should look into their digital sales processes from start to finish and creating digital shopping experiences. It doesn't matter if it's direct to consumer or business to business. The direct to consumer trends are moving into business to business world as well as all of the consumers are now fully trained on what used to be B2C with millennials and, and, and Gen Z. Everyone have those expectations that it has to be slick, it has to be low touch point, it has to be clear. And millennials and Gen Z in, in the workforce kind of are moving towards digital first more and that, that's supported by data as well. From, from a startup standpoint, as a high growth startup founder, there must have been some initial challenges that you would have faced. So if you can throw some light on what were those initial challenges, how did you form a team, the support function, launching of the product, getting those first clients onboarded, how did it all look like and how did you overcome them? Nothing out of ordinary that other startups don't experience, which is mm -hmm. just you know, making sure you secure excellent talent, source mm -hmm. enough revenues, identify a super pain that you can solve for customers and avoid solving lukewarm pains. I would say nothing out of the ordinary in that regard. So it's a short answer here, but I'll just say <laughs> it's still the same challenges that any other startup would say they are experiencing. Well, that's okay. And in your intro, you did mention about working with brands like the McDonald's and the Nestle's of the world. So how did that experience expanded your thought process or helped you leverage that experience in your own startup? How that kind of helped you in yeah. your journey so far? That's such a good question. I'm so happy you asked that. I, I, I keep thinking uh, from time to time about it. So what I learned there was that premium-led sales mm -hmm. marketing is extremely powerful. Like it, it can drive the whole of sales. Let's say, just to give an illustration, you're selling a cereal box, but that sale is actually driven by a premium that the customers found inside of the box. And right. that's like a very sim oversimplification, what, what it means of premium-led sales mm -hmm. in, in that traditional marketing sense. And obviously, the learnings and insights I had there showed me the power of product-led growth. Um, mm -hmm. And by, by what I mean by that is, some startups will have heard, heard that we're entering a golden age of innovation that can't rely on sales-led approach anymore because mm -hmm. people are tired from sales pitches and they don't believe in them anymore. We be overexposed yeah. to products and we are fatigued by interfaces. We actually hate them at, by this point. We are no longer mesmerized by a flashy UI or UX. It's just not going to close a sale. Right. Um, but what kind of has to happen is product-led growth, which means that the product is responsible for attracting new customers and new sales, closing new sales and convincing the audiences. And to do that, we have to target relevant products and services to relevant um, audience segments. Yeah. And that's, that's no easy job to, done, to be done, but yeah. there are people who have done it uh, over and over. Uh, and and yeah. I guess we are those people as well. Yeah. Yeah, easier said than done. But again, that is how simple the process actually is. Again, the formation of the backend looks difficult, but if you have identified the target audience, you get a platform, a dialogue, and you are able to present your product. And the product should speak for itself, right? Once you have shown the product and if you have understood the need, you can relate in terms of what module exactly solves the problem. Again, demonstration and the pitching of the product is important, but the product has to do the job. At least 50% of the sale is what we feel is a product kind of helps you bet. Because the crux of it, you have spent months, years, whatever, to build the product. So when you have a platform, a dialogue where it, you are showcasing the product to a potential client who actually has a need, then the product should speak for itself, right? Yes, and, and, and there, there is this term that, that is popularized more in the 
Silicon Valley obviously is like product qualified leads. Yeah. <laughs> PLQs, I think everyone's going to be talking about that in like next five years or maybe after a couple of more years. But product qualified leads is a real thing and you have to really engineer everything around that as well. It's not yeah. just sales qualified leads or marketing qualified leads, it's product qualified leads and yeah. you know how to do that. I had two hours MQLs versus SQLs all this while. So that is I have this new term coming up. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's, again, it's been around for a while, but I, I can appreciate how it's not a widely used term by like a lot of places, but product qualified leads is a hundred percent. The focus of definitely is the, the, the renowned startups, which I when Silicon, that we hear from Silicon Valley, like, so product qualified leads are scalable startups have managed to achieve that. So we can always copy the successful and re renowned Yeah, startups. the best practices. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And at your setup, how does Marlem use predictive analysis to identify high intent customers and then tailor the marketing efforts accordingly? Yeah. yeah. Again, yeah, it's really, so we use a variety of methods to research what the target audiences are searching for, looking for, or what is trending. Traditionally, from the world of SEO, you would look at cost per click metrics or those kind of metrics that could be lower volume searches, but there they would be more expensive if you bought an ad. So th those are the basic methods to identify. Yeah. And I suppose there are other ways like analyzing trend, trending hashtags and other emerging subjects in the channels where your target leads gather. So that's another method. And then uh, talking about sales funnel, not only managing it, but also optimizing it because that is what you guys do as well. Where do you feel at what stage do you feel that a business of whatever size and small, mid, large scale businesses or enterprises, they would obviously be using some sort of a CRM or kind of automation tool. But for small to mid-sized businesses, where do you feel is you know, the kind of the right stage to get an automation tool into their system to combine things? That's a good question. I would say businesses that have large inventories, SMEs maybe, let's say that have too many resources to manage, yeah. uh, should consider automations even early on, let's right. give an example. Let's say there's a fintech that has 1,000 partnerships or mm -hmm. okay, maybe, maybe that's not the smallest SME, but let's say there's a hotel business chain that has 1,000 rooms they need to advertise. Mm -hmm. Those are the businesses that should look at, into automations because those tools are well in the industry and they, they can do a lot of heavy lifting and right. do more with less resources. And too many leads coming in from multiple channels, right? So kind of, you know, put all of it at one place so that nothing is being missed out. Yeah, I completely get your point. Great, yeah, JJ. And this has been a brilliant conversation. But before we let me go, I would like to play a quick rapid fire with you. I hope you're game for it. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Okay, your last Google search. My last Google search, which I'm sure I did it today. I think, I, I can't recall. I think it was something Technology about... Technology and SEO was easy for you. Oh, uh, actually, my last Google search was this morning about what is the document called that is not a term sheet for closing an investment, but one oh. prior to that. <laughs> oh, okay. That is some news that you revealed over here. Okay. Great. Good luck. Good luck for that one. Yeah. Okay. All right, moving on. Your next vacation. It's going to be in December for Christmas. And I'm uh -huh. just going to spend like a good month in my home country with family and relatives and friends because no one is quite, no one is working actively in London. So yeah, I'll go a month away. Yeah, it's city shuts down for quite some time around the end of the year. So yeah. And... So JJ, what is next? What is next in your life? Marlim is doing good. Obviously, there are things on the cards, but what is next? What's next for us? I guess we want to move the dial on helping 
democratize marketing, sales marketing, mm -hmm. uh, because we what we see in the industry is just mar marketing is loaded with buzzwords, SEO is loaded with buzzwords, <laughs> AI, yeah, is loaded with, AI is loaded with buzz, buzzwords. But to create something super, quite efficient and effective, you have to be an expert in those three, yeah. and think. You know, that's just not possible for businesses to be expert AI, expert SEO, expert marketing yeah. wizards. Uh, and we, uh, there's lots of space to make a difference. Uh, so that's what's next for Marlon. And we're moving a dial in, in that way. All right. Finally, the last question will not kill you any further. Uh, where do you find you on Friday evenings after office? I treat myself to a long walk after uh -huh. work where there's a bit of daydream or maybe like a cocktail or something in hand. And that's like my way to unwind from all the founders slash CEO <laughs> issues uh -huh. and set myself up for a weekend, which I, 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 I admit I don't work on the weekends. That's a hard rule. Yeah, that's where I'm at. Can I'm a founder fine. do that? Can a founder do that, really? They can do that. I absolutely think you must do that. You have to work hard and then rest hard. Okay. Yeah. All right. Lovely. Thank you so much, JJ, for your time and doing this with us. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks so much, Ranmay.